on Giants. Mounds, monsters, myth and man, or Why We Want to Be Small, by Brad Lockwood. Copyright 2010, Brad Lockwood, all rights reserved. The Yuri, Gollum, and Osama. If the Masons, Mormons, clerics, and institutions are each and all suspect, who isn't? Once questions are asked and contradictions identified, it is difficult not to question everyone, including all believers, Native Americans, early accounts, antiquarians, and governments. The bloodthirsty giant still haunting a hilltop along the Allegheny River is said to be an Erie, of the Erie tribe, said to have been eradicated on a single night in 1656 by the Seneca and Mohawk. Today, most Seneca and Mohawks still claim that the Erie were giants, so feared and despised that they simply had to be ambushed on that night, surprise being the only way to beat them in battle, utterly destroyed and erased as a people. Footnote. 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 The fate of the Erie may never be known, nor their full breadth, expanse, population, or territory. Hundreds or tens of thousands, from Buffalo, New York, to Sandusky, Ohio. Interestingly, few Seneca or Mohawk refute further claims that they also consumed flesh on that fateful night. Having just vanquished their feared foe, the Erie, how couldn't they eat their flesh, hope to gain their power? This is an engaging tale, native and local, passed down for centuries, but does it hold up to scrutiny? There is only one documented meeting between whites and the Erie in 1615 near Niagara Falls, but the French in attendance make no mention of the Erie's large stature or anything out of the ordinary. Trade was the sole focus. The French wanted beaver pelts and the Erie armaments to defend themselves from the expansion of the newly united nations of the Iroquois Confederacy, including the Seneca and the Mohawk. The beaver pelt wars raged for decades, with the Erie tribe using alliances with the Wenro and neutrals to aid the French, and the Seneca and other Iroquois nations, like the Mohawk, trying to keep guns from their enemies, the Erie especially. Not to eradicate any giants, but to gain land, trade, and clout, as well as stem the overtrapping and extinction of the beaver, both a coveted commodity and sacred clan symbol. The Iroquois eventually won, culminating on that fateful night in 1656, either totally destroying the Erie, sending them fleeing elsewhere, or enveloping and inbreeding them into the Iroquois Confederacy and other surrounding tribes. Whatever happened, this much is clear. The Erie suddenly disappeared in 1656. However, there are scattered reports of a tribe called Renangawawanka, spelling varying and pronunciation good luck roaming the eastern half of America, and no less than George Washington's great-grandfather meeting with members of a lost tribe of a similar name near Jamestown, Virginia, only a few miles where we've recorded most of this on Giants. Maybe they did become lost after losing their land by force, becoming itinerant until joining with other tribes and losing their distinct culture as a result. And maybe translation problems, the utter loss of dialect and identity, relocation and re-education at American institutions and reservations have led to the confusion, as well as the belief that the Seneca and Mohawk engaged in cannibalism after vanquishing their longtime foe. Quote, we made them women, end quote, or, quote, we ate them up, end quote, were common victory cries of the Seneca and Mohawk, in terms that may easily be misconstrued, especially the latter, as inferring eating human flesh. Yet another reality must be understood, as aptly stated by Paul Shuley, professor of anthropology at Ohio State University and an expert on Western New York and the Erie. If you just wiped out your enemy in a great battle, you wouldn't want to say they were pygmies. After their defeat and disappearance, did the Erie come to be known as giants, to inflate the victory of the Iroquois, even including accounts of cannibalism. Is that how myths are created? Does it take a single act, a battle or a person, one faulty memory or poorly translated war cry to create something altogether extraordinary? Why not the erased Erie as giants, feared foes deposed by the first democracy in America? What happens when myths are created? It's happening every day and equally effectively. 
Osama bin Laden is supposedly a towering secretive holy warrior. Solitary and standing between 6'3 and 6'5, this image has been reinforced for decades by us, mostly through footage showing him standing or sitting alone with maybe one other person in view, hardly offering any accurate, measurable physical perspective. Is this accurate? Since America created him by funding the Mujahideen fighters to defend Afghanistan from the USSR in the 1980s, we needed our man Osama, tall and holier than thou, especially compared to godless communist invaders. But now, after 9-11 and America's failed occupation of Iraq and Afghanistan, where we really should have invaded to begin, thanks Cheney, Osama's physical prowess is being demoted. Multiple CIA agents said to have met him personally in Afghanistan have gone on record to say that Osama bin Laden actually stands hardly six feet tall. So which is he? It is telling that, in addition to shortened stature, reports of bin Laden's hiring of prostitutes and subjugating women have also emerged, as well as repeated references to his need for dialysis for his dying kidneys. Not so tall nor holy, rather sickly, did we make Osama far too towering and far too divine, but now we're retreating because he's no longer on our side. Like the Eerie, did we need our foe bigger than he really was when attacked, yet smaller now that in stalemate? More so, how did bones unearthed, even living and breathing Native Americans like the Eerie, come to be seen as taller, towering, more fearful savages? It's quite rational, really. John Smith, of Jamestown fame, stood around five feet. Everyone was tall to him especially natives who often wore headdresses, making them appear even more immense. It is now taken for granted that Native Americans were taller than Europeans upon first meeting, around five foot eight compared to Smith's standard size around five foot. Europeans in general were much shorter only a few centuries ago. Our great great grandfathers fighting the Civil War were six to eight inches shorter and much, much slighter. It is also important to note that this trend has reversed. Scandinavians, Norwegians specifically, are now the tallest people on earth on average, while Americans, who have dominated this category, are now growing at the slowest rate since the 20th century. Interestingly, experts point not to proteins and locale to explain the difference, but rather what is lacking. Countries with universal health care are still growing tall, while those without, America most visibly, have stalled in stature. Historically, a smattering of early American citations include unusually tall, large, and strong Native Americans being encountered by early European explorers. You can find these anywhere on any giant's website. Invariably soul, involving just one towering savage, whites noted the impressive height and stature of this individual, then they killed him. Usually a leader in his community, most likely a warrior due to his threatening size. Then as today, height is a key characteristic of any leader. Encouraged to mate often to produce more, taller, stronger warriors, this individual was an anomaly who inspired both fear and reverence. Is it any wonder that the tallest member of the community would be sent first, the first misrepresentative of his people, to both greet and warn strangers, trespassers, invaders? Appearance is everything. Perhaps those were mastodon bones that Tiapoli and Cheney unearthed then sent off as, quote, official proof of giants in Cattaraugus County. Rearrange the bones of a mastodon through flooding, decomposition, or during excavation, and you'll get the vague outline of a human. We already know that the bones that in Increase Mather shipped to Europe as proof of Noah's flood in America were. Or was Cheney tricked by what still confounds archaeologists today? As many have told me, bones being unearthed actually look larger than they really are. Cartilage and ligaments dissolved, decomposed, leg bones spread out on the ground, appear longer and bigger than when tightly encased in skin and muscle. Was an early antiquarian merely seeing what modern archaeologists still see today? Bones detached and deceptive. Or, more worrisome, did it even matter what Cheney saw? 
like increased Mather and countless clerics, even Homer, as well as giant enthusiasts and Bigfoot hunters, 